This is the story, a story by Hollister Noble called Woman with a Sword. Our star, Ida Lupino. Our narrator, the famous author, James Hilton. The year 1865. The day, victory. Abraham Lincoln sent the following message to Secretary of War Stanton. Mr. Secretary, I concur most heartily with your recent statement. As you said so eloquently, hers was the greatest course in the war. As an unofficial member of the cabinet, she did the great work that made others famous. Miss Anna Ella Carroll. <laughs> Unusual, isn't it? Anna Ella Carroll, a name you've probably never heard of. I never did until recently. And yet, in Secretary of War Stanton's own words, she did the great work that made others famous. Anna Ella Carroll, woman with a sword. Mr. Lincoln, if this cabinet meeting proves anything at all after one year of war, it proves that we have armies without a plan, a nation without a head. Well, poor as it is, I am the head of this nation by the body's free choice. A, a civilian is confused as yourself and with no legal right whatsoever to dictate to the armed forces. That's the province of our commander-in-chief, General McClellan. The army's plan is to open the Mississippi which uh, none of us have the power to alter. But I may have some more news for you on that subject tomorrow. Well, good day, gentlemen. Good day, Mr. President. Mr. President, Judge Bates to see you. Oh, hello, Judge Bates. Well, Mr. President, did you read it? I have studied it, sir. It proves beyond any doubt the constitutional fact that in time of war, the President becomes Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. Thank heaven. Well, surely the need for secrecy as to this lawyer's identity no longer exists. Who is it? A lawyer whose specialty is transportation, rail, and river. Perfect. He can take a crack at the Mississippi expedition. Where is he? Now, this lawyer is in the other room awaiting an audience. Uh, Mr. President, may I present the author of the document which proves you Commander-in-Chief, Miss Anna Ella Carroll of Maryland. Good afternoon, Mr. President. I'm sorry to see you looking so tired. I'm not tired, ma'am, just flabbergasted. Uh, please do sit down, uh, Miss uh, Carroll. Now you see the need for secrecy. But it's unfair. I'm accustomed to it, Mr. President. This is a man's world. Besides, I'm a southerner. Oh, of course, Anna Ella Carroll. You were the young lady who was charged with being a traitor of the Union, operating right under our noses here in Washington. Yes, I believe the gentleman who proved my treachery was Colonel Lem Evans of Texas. Until I explained that you were the source of all my confidential data, uh, Colonel Evans was only doing his duty. And I should like to do mine. A woman can accomplish many things which men can. Including things men should have done. Your heart is with the South. Your mind tells you that preserving the Union is the only way to preserve the South. Uh, what are you driving at, Mr. President? Our military is staking everything on the Mississippi expedition. We, we must open that great river. Well, you're an expert on transportation. Go to St. Louis, the headquarters of our Mississippi expedition. Then tell me whether you believe it can work. The city is under martial law. I'll need an escort. Fair enough. I've just the man for you. An ardent believer in the Mississippi plan, Colonel M. Evans. You mean the gentleman who charged me with treason? These are my orders. You've no one to blame but yourself. It was you who just made me commander-in-chief. Evans, sir, here Miss Carroll's bags. We'll be docking in St. Louis in a few moments. Oh, uh, thank you. That's a strong current. The Mississippi, ma'am. And heading south like the tide of this war. We're changing that with our expedition. 
Those gunboats built by James Eads are strong and big. Too big. They're for combat, not pleasure. I was thinking of combat, Colonel. They're clumsy. Death traps. The slightest damage can put them out of commission, and our boys will float southward on the current to certain death. If you have some practical suggestion which would alter the Mississippi and make it run backwards, I'm sure we'd all be indebted to you. Why not alter the plans of men, Colonel? I've interviewed everyone out here, and I'm convinced that no intelligent person can support the Mississippi expedition. Surely you're not suggesting the Mississippi expedition is stupid and unworkable. You express my feelings very well, sir. The armies that will win this war must be transported by river. That's why the enemy waits on one end of the Mississippi and we at the other. But the southward current is on their side. Which we will fight with our gunboats. A contest you cannot win. The chances of war, ma'am. Not war, Colonel. Suicide. Now the boat's in. I have completed my function as your guide. Now say good night, Miss Carroll. I trust, Colonel. There's still enough southern chivalry left in you to help me with my bags to the dock. By all means, ma'am. What's that? Boatload of wounded soldiers, miss. All right there. Pile the wounded under the shed. Make way down below for the ambulances. Careful of the medicine. It's all that's left. Let me through, pilot. Are you a nurse, ma'am? I'm here on official business from Washington. These are my credentials. Credentials. More papers. If you're not a nurse, there's no room for you here, ma'am. Not a pleasant sight for a woman's eyes, either. Wounded and maimed they are. Two hundred left out of two thousand. What happened, pilot? I'm Colonel Evans. They knocked out the engines of our five gunboats. We drifted downstream. Living targets. By the time the engine of our one boat was repaired to pull back north, 1,800 had been slaughtered. Please let us through. Sergeant, let this lady and gentleman through. Right, Captain. Oh. Uh, wait, Martha. It's still soon. Must be the lad's wife. A sweetheart, he keeps talking to her. I don't want to die. We can't all be cowards. I heard the others. I, I saw them. Don't you see, Martha? It wasn't like fighting and losing. The river was against us. It was... Losing with, without a chance to fight. You are not cowards. You are heroes. And you'll all have a fair chance to fight. I promise you. I swear it. Mm. That's how they die, all of them. Speaking of the chance to fight they didn't have. Pilot, get us some smelling salts and water. Sergeant, smelling salts in the canteen. Quick about it. Aye, sir. Cowards. Yes, cowards. Afraid to admit you're wrong. Sending men to their deaths without a chance for victory. Easy, Miss Carroll. You'll be in bed soon. And what a fair bed. Six feet of earth or the cold bottom of the river. The river. The river. That's it. It does flow north. She's hysterical. The Tennessee River. And it would split the rebel armies in half. Captain, we'd better get her to the pilot's house. She's delirious. She may be delirious, Colonel, but she's talking facts for sure. The Tennessee River does flow north, and taking it would split the rebel forces. The Mississippi flows south, with enemies at either end. A plan for war ending in disaster. But the Tennessee flows north, with friends at either end. A plan for victory ending in peace. Oh, I don't need smelling salts. What I want is the pilot's logbook, river maps, pencil and paper. Uh, how long have you been on these rivers, pilot? Just a week shy of 40 years, Miss Carroll. Then you know them well. As well as you know the human heart, young lady. Good, we have work to do. There's a study in my hotel suite. And you are free to join us, Colonel Evans. That is, if you care to. Four o'clock, Miss Carroll, and I admit defeat. My brain won't work. My eyes are shutting. Now, you're quite sure, Pilot Scott, that the Tennessee River is not too shallow at any point to carry those heavy gunboats. Not to my knowledge. And from General Grant, you know for a fact that beyond Forts Henry and Donaldson, there are no southern soldiers stationed along the Tennessee. They're all inland or on the Mississippi. Oh, then the shores of the Tennessee are not flanked by rebel soldiers. Only southerners, Americans... Loyal to the Union. We hope. Hope means uncertainty, pilot. And I have none. I am as certain of the depth of their loyalty as you are of the Tennessee. Now, if some of our gunboats were disabled on the Tennessee River, they'd float north, back into Union hands. Any fool who's piloted a boat in the Tennessee would confirm that. And why in heaven's name has no one thought of asking you river pilots? You seem to have forgotten. We are all southerners. And you have forgotten, pilot. We now have a commander-in-chief who 
doesn't think in terms of North and South, but only in terms of Americans, loyal to the Union. Miss Carroll, of all the idiots in this army, I, I must be the biggest. I should have realized that you sought the answers to questions that we lack courage to face. The fight for Anna Carroll's Tennessee plan was only begun. By her own choice, her authorship was kept a secret. Some thought the plan was Lincoln's. Others thought it was Grant's. President Lincoln fought for it. Stanton agreed to become Secretary of War on condition that the Union abandon the Mississippi expedition and carry through Anne's Tennessee plan. But on every other side, the plan met with nothing but resistance. So here we are. Anna Ella Carroll is waiting in a room adjoining the presidential chamber. Unaware that she's listening in the next room are assembled the leaders of the military, transportation experts, the men in charge of guiding the war. Mr. President, I was born in Tennessee. The Tennessee River is not deep enough to carry the gunboats into southern territory. Thank you, Senator Johnson. We'll weigh your remarks with due respect. Uh, Mr. President, I take it you're determined not to disclose the name of the author of this so-called Tennessee plan. Correct, sir, for reasons of security. Security? With no disrespect, Mr. President, your so-called Tennessee plan is so disastrous, I'm... Uh, I'm forced to the conclusion that its author is either a civilian, a, an amateur, or a rebel. You are forced, General, into rudeness by the painful necessity of facing the bare possibility that we were in error, while the author of this plan is correct. Good day, gentlemen. We reconvene tomorrow morning. You heard, Miss Carroll? <laughs> Civilian. Amateur rebel. Need only add the word woman. Oh, Mr. President, give them proof. Once fought Henry and Donaldson fall. All it would take is one Union gunboat on the Tennessee River with a crew of 15. It could go all the way into Mississippi and Alabama without a shot being fired. And I can prove it. Can you? Where would you find men brave enough to volunteer for such a mission? Pilot Scott and 13 of his riverboat crew. That still leaves one. Sir, you seem to have forgotten me. Mr. President, Forts Henry and Donaldson are being captured. Good. Now pray God that young lady can prove her case. Pilot, you're sure the crew doesn't know I'm on board? Quite sure, Miss Carroll. Have we passed the worst of it? No, ma'am. Up ahead is the low water mark. Oh, it has to be deep enough. It has to. The Union depends on it. And? Lem. Lem, what are you doing here? How could you have planned to do this without me? Well, I, I thought you might still disagree with this plan. That was only one of many mistakes I've made. And since corrected. Oh, Lem, I'm glad you're here. And? And there's one mistake I can't afford to make. And that would be not to tell you how much I've come to love you in so short a time. And I must tell you that I feel the same about you, Len. In fact, at this moment, it's the only thing I'm really sure of. Oh, this is a good time to be sure of such a thing. Here it comes, Miss Carroll. Low water mark. We're inches from bottom now. Close your eyes and pray. cleared it. And at low water. All that remains to be tested now, Miss Carroll, is the depth of southern loyalty. It's my first mate. We're in enemy waters, Captain. The sun's up. Shall we man the guns? No. Break out the flag and stand by to hoist. But Captain, they've seen us, and they're rushing out of their houses to the shore with guns. You heard the orders. Head closer to shore, pilot. Aye, man. Not a promising welcome. Waiting orders, ma'am. Hoist the Union flag with full naval ceremony. Hadn't we ought to wait until we find out their reaction? That's the only way to find out their reaction. 
Hoist the Union flag with full ceremony. Now it will. Union armies win smashing victory at Vicksburg. Union army occupies Chattanooga. Atlanta captured. Richmond surrenders. Suddenly a war ends. The limits as though somewhere it isn't really over. Oh, but it is over, darling. Now we can go to Texas as Mr. and Mrs. Evans. What a wonderful fruit of victory. The only fruit of victory that will satisfy me is an end to this conspiracy of silence about you. Your plan won the war, and the world has been clamoring for its author. When you speak to Mr. Lincoln alone today, you better raise this question or I will. Oh, spoken like a man of the family. Oh, here he comes. Here comes the president. Good morning, Mr. President. Wonderful morning. Won't you join me, Miss Carroll? Thank you. Well, Miss Carroll, you made a commander-in-chief. You gave him a plan. You helped him carry it out. You won a war. Sir, my thoughts are on peace. The Secretary of War, Stanton, spoke to me last night. He advised me that... He would consider it a great privilege to present you to Congress and Senate as the author of the Tennessee Plan, demanding legislation that would grant you the honorary pay of a major general of the Union armies, dating from 1861. Mr. President. However, exercising my prerogative as president, I turn him down. I, I understand. The privilege of presenting you to Congress and Senate is something I insist upon doing myself. Thank you, Mr. President. Before us lies the mangled road to peace, Miss Carroll. You come from Maryland. A lot of important work could be done there. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I'm marrying Lem Evans and returning to Texas with him. Well, war's over. I'm no longer commander-in-chief. You should go to Texas. And uh, perhaps I should reread that verse which comes from the Bible. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time of war and a time of peace. Yes, Mr. President, and peace is the season for love. Lem, are you sure I look right in this dress? Well, you don't look like a major general, darling. But you do look like my bride-to-be. Oh, that must be my bonnet. Come in. Judge Bates. What is it? President Lincoln was shot an hour ago. Shot? Is he badly hurt? He's dying. Oh, no. I don't believe it. Oh. Oh. Now that you're more composed, Dan, I must speak of something. I, the president has planned to present you for recognition today, as you know. Secretary of War Stanton can do it instead. The decision is entirely up to you. But you realize, then, that such an announcement at this time would jeopardize the peace. Will there ever be a proper time wait, to... Wait, wait, Len. The president was right, and we were wrong. We called it peace, and in its deceptive glow, a killer aimed... Now Lincoln is dead. We have not won the peace, Lynn. We must still fight for it. Judge Bates, please inform the Secretary of War that I would consider it most inappropriate to present me to the Congress and Senate at this time of national disaster. And you're making it easier for all of us. 
We will be grateful. Good night. Anne. Anne, what were you trying to tell me? Lem, darling. I, too, should like to rest. I would like to be alone. I have a lot of thinking to do. To the honorable, the very honorable Lem Evans, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the State of Texas. My darling, darling Lem. Yes, in the last three years, my answers to your letters have been infrequent and far too brief. My heart has been too full to permit it more expression. Now my head is in command. And I can tell you with all my heart that I love you and always shall and hope one day to share a happy life with you in Texas. But the peace is not yet won and in time of war, each defends his home. Yours is Texas, mine is Maryland. Perhaps you are right that there is no real end to the fight for peace and therefore to the road I'm traveling. But I desperately hope you are wrong. But even if you aren't, I cannot leave the battlefield now. The fact that I have not received recognition does not matter. Someday, somehow, that recognition will come. I have no hunger for it, Lem. My hunger is only for you. Sometimes I feel that I must rush blindly to Texas at once, forgetting everything. But then I remember. I remember the last words that President Lincoln spoke to me. And I know now why he spoke them. And I hope that you too may understand. To everything there is a season. And a time for every purpose under the heaven. A time of war and a time of peace. Yours forever and ever, Anna Ella Carroll. You have been listening to Woman with a Sword, a story by Hollister Noble. Ida Lupino played the starring role, and the narrator was the celebrated author, James Hilton. This is the story was a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. <laughs>